Evening everyone, uh, welcome to uh, this community event. Uh, my name's Ed Garrett, I'm the Chief Executive of uh, the Clinical Commissioning Groups in the Suffolk and North East Essex and uh, the Executive Lead for our Integrated Care System. So uh, tonight's session is really to hear from you about the questions and queries and concerns that you might have around the vaccination programme and I've got a brilliant panel of uh, colleagues here to uh, help uh, me answer all, the, all of your questions uh, and uh, be very clear on uh, anything that you want to uh, suggest to us. So uh, before I introduce my panel, um, what I thought I'd do is just give you um, some headlines of uh, where we've got to uh, as a programme. Um, and I th I'm hoping that you all agree that we're making some really encouraging progress. So uh, we launched our programme properly with all, our, all of our sites on the 18th of January, which seems a long time ago, but actually still quite recent. Uh, and uh, today we've so far done uh, 345,000 uh, first doses in Suffolk and North East Essex, which is a really phenomenal uh, achievement. And thank you to everyone involved with that. To put that into context, uh, just as, as a system in Suffolk and North East Essex, we've done more first doses than the whole of Ireland, uh, Croatia, uh, Bulgaria and uh, Iceland, as well as uh, some other European countries too. So that just gives you a sense of the scale of the uh, progress and achievement <clears throat> so far. Uh, as you'll have seen this week, uh, the Prime Minister is setting out uh, some key milestones for us to get to. Uh, and uh, the first one is uh, to have offered a first dose to all over 50s uh, by the middle of April. Uh, and we're making good progress on that. So we've we've done offered, we've given a first dose to 70% of our over 50s uh, so far in our system. So I feel we're on track to meet that milestone by mid April. And the, the, the second major milestone is to offer a first dose uh, to all of the adults in Suffolk and North East Essex by the end of July. And so far we have given a first dose to 40% uh, of our over 16 population in our system. So uh, a long way to go, uh, but we're really encouraged uh, with the progress that we're making. Currently we uh, we're working through the first six cohorts of the national uh, list, which is um, the over uh, 65s uh, upwards, and uh, in particular, currently cohort six, which is um, anyone with an underlying health condition aged between 16 and 64 uh, plus uh, our unpaid carer community. Uh, but we're, we're making really good progress, as I've suggested. Uh, the final thing I want to say um, before I introduce the panel and hand over to our Director of uh, Public Health is that uh, whilst uh, I've kind of talked about the big numbers that we've covered and the population that we've covered, we're also very committed to making sure that everyone has a vaccination and, and uh, thinking about the few as well as the many. So we're, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that we reach our marginalised and vulnerable uh, communities and, and communities that haven't uh, necessarily wanted to come forward uh, for the vaccine. So we're, we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure that everyone is you know, everyone is safe. So the small numbers are also as important as, as the big numbers that I've described. So on the, on the panel tonight, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Mark Shenton, who's a, uh, a GP uh, based in Stowmarket, but also a professor at uh, our local university and chair of our clinical commissioning group. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Juno uh, from Ipswich, who's a um, very well known community figure and uh, a member of our clinical commissioning group in Ipswich, New Suffolk. Uh, we've got Pam Green, who's our chief operating officer at uh, North East Essex uh, CCG, and Pam's been absolutely central to the vaccination uh, programme there in Essex. Uh, we've got Stuart Keeble, who's the director of public health uh, for Suffolk. We've got Lisa Nobes, who's the Director of Nursing uh, in Suffolk and uh, North East Essex CCGs. We've got David Pannell, who's Chief Executive of the Suffolk GP Federation, who are running five uh, vaccination sites across 
Suffolk and we've got Simon Morgan who's our head of communications in, in the local NHS and he uh, will be kind of uh, comparing the event and uh, putting questions to us. So I'll hand over to Stuart now and then we'll uh, we'll field all the questions that come through. So over to you Stuart. Thank you um, Ed and uh, good evening everybody. Um, so just to really give you a picture of where we are with re with regards to, to COVID um, in Suffolk and North East Essex and just really to uh, reflect on where we are and kind of where we're heading at the moment and, and I'll just take a moment also to talk a bit about community testing as well. So so clearly we're seeing a welcome direction of travel with the number of cases of COVID um, across the various areas and, and and just to put it in context I mean just from a Suffolk perspective on the, on the 4th of January which was the, the peak of, of this current wave we had about 4100 cases in the previous seven days and that is now down to about 503 so we have seen the rates drop um, considerably uh, across uh, across the country but across the east of England and across uh, Suffolk and North East Essex I mean we're currently seeing the highest rates at the moment are, are in the tendering area uh, uh, with a rate of about 124 cases per 100,000 the lowest in in kind of the mid Suffolk area which is kind of north of Ipswich at around 45 cases per 100,000. But in general, uh, the areas covered by, by, by the integrated care system uh, are kind of around the, the, the kind of the national average or below. Um, but, but we do have to put that in context that we're clearly we're going in the right direction, but we're still actually seeing quite high numbers of cases relative to what we saw say in, in, in the late summer early autumn. So uh, in the last week of August, we saw 23 cases, so quite a large difference and, and, and we're very much heading in the right direction and the vaccine programme is a key part of that, but we've, we've, we've still got to be um, really, uh, really careful in that sense. And, 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 and as part of the national lockdown, we have started to see quite a large decrease in the number of people in, in local hospitals uh, due to COVID and at the peak there was about 670 people in West Suffolk, Colchester and Ipswich Hospital and that's down to about 170 um, and, and a large part of that is due to the lockdown but we are starting to see promisingly the impact of the great efforts that have gone into the vaccination programme especially amongst the over 75s and over 80s at national level and I think in the local data we're starting to see a, 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 a faster fall in the admissions uh, um, in those age groups showing that the vaccine is starting to kick in. And, and I appreciate that uh, we've now got this roadmap and people want us to move as quickly as possible to get our freedoms back. And, and I mean, I'm very clear, my, my, my parents would very much love to hug their grandchildren, but I think we, 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 need, to keep, uh, we need to keep following the guidance and, and following, following the advice at the moment because, um, because I mean, we've we've obviously given the first vaccine vaccine to to many of the uh, of the most vulnerable groups, but actually, when you look at it, there's still a large part of the working age population that haven't been vaccinated. And I think one of the stats that surprised me was that about about 45% of people, this is at a national level, um, in ITU for COVID are actually under the age of 60. So so although we're starting to protect our most vulnerable, we need to ensure that everybody is protecting themselves and 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 keeping the rates down. But ultimately, we, we're very much heading in, in, in a good direction. Uh, and, and just vaccines are a key part of our roadmap out of where we've been for the last year. But also testing for people without symptoms is going to be really important, especially over the next five to six months. As we know that one in three people actually with COVID do not have any symptoms. So that's why uh, across uh, Suffolk and within uh, North East Essex, we've been setting up community testing sites for asymptomatic testing. So we've got 12 main sites in Suffolk, which operate uh, seven days a, a week, running from about seven o'clock in the morning till uh, about six o'clock at night. And we're also opening up further community sites in smaller towns and villages. And we've undertaken about 17,000 tests so far, and we've identified 80 positive cases of people that wouldn't know that they had COVID in the first place. So each of those cases could have left to further spread within within households and communities. So, so we're trying to push the ethos now that if you need to leave the home, if, you're, if you can't work from home, if you may need to go and care for somebody, um, if you're taking with your children going back to school, we're trying to get people to get into the habit of getting tested twice a week. And that will provide and help to reduce the chains of transmission while we're rolling the vaccine programme out more broadly. 
Um, and so for people who want to be able to access our community testing, they, they can access that on both the Suffolk County Council website and the Essex County Council website, where you can find the details of your local sites. So really two key pillars, uh, the vaccine and then and in support the community testing. Um, so that's everything from me, um, Simon. So quite happy to hand over. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. We've uh, we've got a few questions coming in now, so we'll we'll get those uh, to the panel. And don't forget, you can have your question on our Q and A chat facility as well. Do post your question. Please keep them nice and short. The questions so that we can get through as many as we can over the next um, 45, 50 minutes or so. So let's start with the first one, and this one I think goes to uh, Mark. The question is from Rob in Chantry who asks, when are you vaccinating over 50s in this area, please? I am 54 this year and want to return to work after being vaccinated. Mark. Thank you, uh, Simon, and uh, thank you for the question. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so 54 this year, so in the 50 to 55 bracket, uh, we're currently vaccinating the 65 plus um, and uh, making good progress getting through uh, through them. So we'll be into the 60 plus. Um, so I, I would imagine as the um, as we are allowed to vaccinate, we'll probably be on schedule for when they say to the 50 to 55 group in terms of when that might be. Um, I think we were talking about this earlier. We we're wondering whether we might even be as uh, as early as mid March, um, but there will be national direction on the invitation. Um, the in terms of getting back to work, um, of course, uh, you won't be fully protected as soon as you've had your vaccination. It takes three weeks to uh, reach its efficacy, prime efficacy. And your second dose will uh, be given, second vaccination will be given 12 weeks or so later, and your full protection will not be available to you until after that. Um, so the, in terms of why you may be not able to go back to work, you'll have to consider um, you know, the reasons for that, the personal reasons that you've got for that, and that the hands, face, space, and the shielding where required is still really important um, even after you had your first vaccination. Thank you, Mark. Um, any of the other panel members like to address that at all? Any other comments in relation to that question from Rob in Chantry? In which case, let's move on to the next question. This one from Alex. My mother is worried that she hasn't had a date from Suffolk and North East Essex for her second vaccine. Her 12 week deadline is up on the 30th of April. When will she get an invite? Um, David. Um, I understand um, people are concerned that they haven't necessarily got a, a, a date for their second uh, vaccination at the moment, but please be assured that um, the, the organisations that uh, undertook the first vaccination know exactly who needs um, a second vaccination and, and when within the, within the timeframes set out by NHS England and they will be in touch with you. Uh, at the moment everyone's prioritising uh, the first vaccination so they will be in touch. It may well be quite close to the date um, that's needed, uh, maybe only a week or so before, um, but rest assured that everybody will have their second vaccination within the time frame that, um, that we're required to give. Thank you, David. Would any of the other panel members like to come in at all with, the, with that question? OK, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your question there. Hope that uh, answers um, your, your concern. Um, a question now from Councillor Margaret Marks. With children acknowledged vectors of COVID and the opening of schools on the 8th of March, would it not be sensible to escalate teachers to the front of the over 50s queue in order to avoid absences which further affect education? Uh, and I think that question might go to uh, Juno. Uh, with uh, Stuart and perhaps Lisa coming in afterwards, if that's okay. Yeah, no, certainly. Hi, I'm Juno. I'm a GP uh, locally, and uh, the this is a really good question. And the question comes up also with uh, policemen, shop workers, etc. Now, the Joint Committee uh, for uh, Vaccinations 
looked at everyone's risk in determining when they're going to be done. And they made a decision quite early on that all the groups I just mentioned, including the teachers, wouldn't actually be done uh, in the first cohorts, uh, and they would be done with the under 50s. Now, that was a decision they made back in the autumn, really, or late autumn, early winter. And uh, the evidence has suggested that they were right because the infection rates amongst teachers isn't any higher uh, than would be expected for their age and their any uh, illnesses they may have. So uh, even though in theory it sounds sensible to do so, uh, the, the real experts uh, who work very closely with the government have deemed that the teachers don't need to be prioritised. Though I agree with you, common sense would suggest they might be, but the evidence suggests that the experts are probably right and they will be done in due course, uh, unless they have any other conditions which puts them, uh, bumps them up the, the scale. But generally speaking, if you've got a, a fit and well teacher uh, in their 30s or 40s, they will be done with the under 50s group, which, as Mark said, might start in March, but realistically, uh, maybe April, so don't worry too much if you haven't heard uh, or if they haven't started, then different bits of the country, different bits of our system uh, are uh, further ahead with the cohorts they're vaccinating. So probably the majority of people may start getting vaccinated from April onwards. But the government did, of course, bring forward uh, their aim to vaccinate the whole of the adult population from the autumn to the 31st of July. So everything's moving forward quite nicely at the moment. Thank you, Juno. Uh, Lisa, is there anything else you'd like to add there at all? I just wanted to add, um, abs Juno's absolutely right, apart from one little exception to that, which is for um, teaching staff that are working in schools that um, provide education for children with special educational needs and disabilities, who often have a, a caring role in that. So obviously cohort six, we are vaccinating carers and we have taken into that cohort any teaching staff at special education schools that are also providing a caring role. That's the only exception. Thank you. Thanks Lisa. Stuart, anything from yourself at all? Yes, thank you um, Councillor Marks for the question. I mean I think it's interesting that clearly uh, people are concerned about uh, children going back and the potential impact on, on cases. I think our understanding still about whether children are the main vector actually in itself is, 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 is still not completely clear. I think what's important to say is that the introduction now as part of the roadmap, uh, secondary school teachers will, will, be able to, uh, test, will be able to test from home using lateral flow tests twice a week and also uh, high school pupils will also be able to do that and we're trying to support parents and families to do the test. So I think a key bit is that we want to try and prevent people coming into school in the first place that may be infected. So I think that will help hopefully with the resilience in schools that we will, we will help to prevent the spread from happening where it does happen in the first place. And we very much support Juno's statement around the data around the risk. I think if we were to put all the teachers in now, there is a question that those at higher risk of mortality and death would have to be put back to enable those people to be vaccinated. So I do very much support the JCVI statement around that. Lovely. Thanks, Stuart. And uh, two questions in one here. So uh, both of these questions ask um, the same thing, but there's a there's a slight uh, difference to the second question. So let me just ask this first one. Can you tell me how safe it is for the second vaccine to be 16 weeks after the first? Also, my mum is 90 and housebound and has not had her vaccine yet. And the second question, which is similar to the to the first one, um, which again relates to 16 week issue, um, she adds, I'm only being offered um, the um, vaccine 16 weeks rather than the 12 to the 10 to 12 weeks. Um, is this correct? So perhaps I can ask Mark that first question in relation to the 16 week issue. And perhaps Pam might want to come in in relation to the, the housebound and how we're, how we're vaccinating the housebound patients in our area. So um, I might need a little bit of help with 16 weeks, but um, certainly a minimum of 12 has been set because of the ability to get those who are most at risk of serious illness and death vaccinated um, in the quickest order that we can. 
So the, the boost to the immunity of the second vaccine at 12 weeks is thought to be more efficacious, um, whilst also giving us the, the ability to um, get, get the cohorts who need it most through. So at 16 weeks, um, I, I would imagine that there is still the chance that you'll get excellent response. Um, but I don't know whether any of my colleagues can help me out further on the additional time frame there. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to come in on that, Mark. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, the the questioner seems to imply that they've been given a 16 week uh, second dose. Uh, I must admit I've never heard of that happening. So I do wonder if it's worth going back to the person who gave that information and say, oh, sorry, this is 16 weeks and not 12. Uh, the trials are actually done with sort of dosing of sort of three, four, maybe possibly five weeks. Uh, our uh, government uh, raised some eyebrows when they said uh, it can be delayed to 12 weeks so that more people can be vaccinated. I think it's, uh, it's worked out fairly well because we've managed to vaccinate a lot more people as a consequence. And uh, the, the studies that are being done are actually showing that the first dose does give a high degree of protection. So I think our, our decision was right there, but I haven't seen anywhere, unless uh, someone else in the panel knows, that that 12 weeks should be stretched to 16. So I do think it might be an error. Uh, and I think it's worth going back to the provider and asking them uh, why they've given 16 weeks. OK, thank you, Juno. So the advice there is to, to seek uh, advice to go back to your um, your GP or wherever you were offered the, the, the second dose vaccine and just to gain clarification on that. And then perhaps to Pam, um, is there anything you'd like to add in relation to that and, in, and indeed about how we're vaccinating housebound uh, patients? Pam and maybe Lisa as well on that. Yeah, so, so I think we're really uh, fortunate that our GP practices know our housebound patients very well. So um, by practice, uh, each uh, you know, cohort of housebound patients have been making contact and they've been uh, coming, going out and vaccinating them in their homes. The other thing that we have is uh, we're very fortunate as a clinical commissioning group that we have a, a good number of clinicians within our teams that are trained as vaccinators. So we have been able to support practices in the rollout by uh, our nurses and uh, allied health professionals like physiotherapists, occupational therapists that are trained vaccinators to go out and get those uh, housebound patients done. So, so it's a mixed approach depending on uh, which area you're in, but it's um, it's something as I say that the 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 practices know their patients very well and know who are housebound. So we've been supporting them uh, from that perspective. Thanks, Pam. Right. Lisa? Uh, the only thing I would add to that is if, if your mum is 90 and is housebound and hasn't had any information or invitation for vaccine or has you've had no contact at all, then I would definitely contact her GP surgery because there may be some information missing on her patient records or something. So she should have been offered a vaccine by now. So I would um, suggest that you need to contact the GP surgery. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, next question here. When will students get their vaccines? Who should we give that to? Stuart, is that something you might be able to answer? Or are you on mute? I mean, I think at the moment, uh, um, trials are starting on 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 students and, and, and young people uh, with regards to um, the vaccine um, and, and that was reported in the last last few weeks that that's kicked that, that that's been kicked off. Um, I think uh, when we look at it, um, it's unlikely, I think, to be happening in, in, in the near future. I think there's some discussions that maybe in the late autumn, if they move in that direction or, or even even uh, um, early winter. Um, I mean, ultimately, I think there's a balance of risk around the vaccines and 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 they've got to work out what's the most effective and what age groups it might benefit. We know that the risks to to, 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 to young people and especially the youngest uh, from COVID infections are very, uh, very small. Um, and, and and therefore, I think uh, it's right that we wait for uh, the outcome of the trials to um, to see what might be uh, the most effective way 
um, of, of, of looking at that. Thanks, Stuart. Um, any other panel members like to come in at all with uh, with any additional comments on that question? In which case, we'll move on. Oh, sorry, I'm. Do you know? I'm happy to make a little comment. So, uh, it depends on the age of the student. So, uh, if you're referring to a, a 16 or under uh, or under 16, uh, then uh, Stuart's right. Uh, trials are, are being have been launched looking at, I think it's six to 16 or something. So really uh, young children, and that probably won't uh, result in vaccinations to late autumn or winter, as Stuart says. But if you're talking about a university students, then they will actually be vaccinated with the under, under 50. So 18 and above, hopefully from March, April onwards. Thank you very much. Um, question from Sue now. Second doses will be needed by many by April. How will the system and supply cope with these alongside the ongoing first vaccinations? Who might be able to come in with the response to that? Shall we go to David? Um, so, so we've been assured that um, uh, the, the supply of vaccine for second doses will match the supply of the first. Um, that's why, um, uh, you know, people were confident people would be booked in for those uh, second appointments. Thank you. Ed, would you like to come in there? Yeah, no, I, I got um, confirmation from NHS England today on that, that the, the vaccine for the second doses is ring fence nationally. So that's absolutely protected that each system will get that vaccine for the second doses, which is really, really good news to hear. Good news. Thank you, Ed. Um, question from Peter now, Peter Baldry. I wanted to ask if there is a possibility for younger people that are relying on the vaccine for work, whether they could receive spare or surplus vaccinations sooner. Ed, is that something you might be able to answer? Well, it might might be a good question to put to the the, the GPs who are running sites. So each site, I, I um, believe, have sort of reservists, um, so that if there's any vaccine at the end of the day to be used up, it'll uh, it'll be used, not wasted. Uh, but perhaps uh, Juno, interested in how you um, and maybe Pam, how how you run things. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I think that uh, you're right, that, that the key here is not to waste the vaccine. And I'm perhaps going to uh, ask David or Mark if they keep a reserve list, because that does seem a sensible thing for people who can come in at very short notice, half an hour, etc., late in the day, say after six o'clock. Uh, perhaps they can answer specifically whether that happens at their sites. Shall I go for? I, th I think each site works um, works like slightly differently across Suffolk and Northeast Essex. So I'll just say for the sites that we run, we, we don't we don't we don't have a formal reserve list. What we do is we from the cohort that we're vaccinating, uh, we know at the lunchtime on the last day how how many patients we need to have lined up. So we we continue calling from that cohort, or if we finish that cohort, the cohort below, rather than have, asking people to. Um, to wait outside um, on the off chance of whether there's spare vaccine or not. Thank you, David. Um, Pam, did you want to come in there? Yeah, that, that's really the same for us. So we try and do it on a daily basis. Uh, so because we've been running some long days, we realise that getting people in between eight and ten o'clock in an evening, particularly when it was cold, wasn't wasn't going to work. So we we try and get through. Uh, and run the the whole tray um, on a on a day by day basis, so we don't have you know forty at the end of three days. Uh, we have had some reserve lifts around health and social care workers that have found it difficult to access particular areas, uh, and we've called them in. But we are ringing through uh, the age groups just to absolutely capture everybody and working with our local practices to do that. Um, so yeah, it's it's the same really. Thanks, Pam. Any other comments at all in relation to that question? Yeah, from from me. Um, so I, I, I think that it's important to know that we should try and stay within the cohorts as defined by the, um, the guidance um, so that um, 
you know, we, we are trying to uh, ensure that the most um, vulnerable are getting theirs at the time that they need it. Um, and as David, just a reiteration of what David's saying, it's really important that people aren't turning up at um, uh, vaccine sites at the end of the day, trying to see if there's any spare vaccine because that leads to potential issues with crowding, um, with uh, social distancing and um, uh, you know, difficulty for staff who are trying to finish the vaccinations off for that day and being able to conclude their, uh, their work without having to deal with um, people who are hoping to um, get in on a vaccination, so appointment only really. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's half past six. We're halfway through our, our live Q&A this evening on the vaccination process. Question now from Samir, which I think is for David uh, at the Federation. How do you get the address corrected in the software being used for sending invitations, even though the address is correct in the NHS digital and GP surgery database? I'm asking David because um, Samir wrote an earlier question which did mention the Federation. It was quite a long uh, question, so I'm grateful that you were able to uh, to shorten that down a bit. So David, over to you. Are you able to, to answer that one, please? Uh, yes, Samir. So I think there's two elements to it. Uh, one is the address and one is uh, your the mobile phone number. So we do take the data from the uh, GP practice system, which is the NHS uh, record. So there's obviously been a problem here. Um, what I would suggest, Samir, is if you could um, email info at suffolkfed.org.uk. Um, I'll sort this out. I just there's just one element of, of your question that I just need to, to check that um, uh, but I'll, I can sort that out if you can email that to me. Lovely, thank you David. And in terms of uh, email addresses, is there a, an email address that you could you could share with Samir at this time or, or uh, what's the best way of him getting in touch with you? Um, so if you could email in info at suffolkfed alloneword.org.uk. Super, thank you very much indeed. Uh, next question then, will the vaccine influence international travelling? Will the vaccine influence international travelling? Um, Stuart, is that one you might be able to pick up at all? On mute. Um, so th there's a great deal of discussion at the moment and and, the, the, and there was a comment from the Prime Minister about uh, I suppose uh, almost passports um, around what we may or may not be able to do uh, based on whether we've been vaccinated so I know at this point in time the um, the government is looking at options there are pros and cons I think with with, with all of these different solutions I think the the key point I would say and 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 if you look at the government roadmap is that there, there will be a review at all stages around foreign travel uh, and the reality is that we are concerned about variants from other parts of the world and and therefore we need to be really careful around that so I think any decisions around that will need to look at both for protection from the individual themselves around vaccination but also um, what the guidelines might be for those countries from travel but also about ensuring we protect people by not bringing new variants back into this country so um, so so at this point I think it's a watch this space and and it will evolve over time depending both on what policies developed by the government but also what's happening around the rest of the world Thanks, Stuart. Juno, is there anything you'd like to come in at all with relation to will the vaccine influence international travelling? Yeah, uh, so I, I, yeah, I'd agree with Stuart, uh, and I think the answer is almost certainly yes, it will. Uh, and uh, it's important to realise that we're uh, ahead of a lot of countries and that a lot of countries who don't get vaccinated, I think they're, they're talking about fully till 2023. So uh, it's if we may be able to travel abroad, uh, even with a vaccine passport of some form, confirm we've had the vaccine, but our government may not allow us back into the country without a quarantine period. So uh, even though lots of people are signing up for holidays, uh, we don't know whether they're going to have uh, to quarantine on return for 10 to 14 days. And, and that may not be something that people have acted in. Uh, if you watch the news last night, it also talked about individual employers perhaps saying that they may not take on new staff unless they've uh, had the vaccine. There was a big care agency talking about that. I think current staff were exempt from that. Uh, so though no one uh, is being forced to have the vaccine in this country, 
it looks as though increasingly uh, there are additional advantages to making sure you have the vaccine, uh, which I, I should say is very safe. And, and no one uh, has died from the vaccine internationally. There have been some deaths, but uh, after the vaccine, but none of them have been actually attributed to the vaccine unless anyone else on the panel uh, knows something I don't. So it's, it's a very, very safe vaccine to have. Thank you. Mark wants to come in, Mark. Yeah, I, I, there was someone who's um, cleverer than me says no one's safe until we're all protected, uh, which includes um, uh, the, the, the rest of the world. And COVAX has been launched today um, in support of getting vaccines to um, uh, 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 underdeveloped areas of the world as well as um, uh, it, so, you know, this isn't just about us, it's about what's happening abroad. And of course, the um, Oxford AstraZeneca um, jab was developed on the back of um, uh, government um, support um, so that it was low cost and could be used um, to support vaccinating um, globally as well. So, you know, international travel will be great back to get back to that. But if the rest of the world is a safer place, um, then that will be better for all of us. Thanks, Mark. Any other panel members want to come in there at all? In which case, we'll move on to the next question. Um, the question is as follows. I work with people from different nationalities. One of them is the black community. The majority of them do not want to have the COVID jab. And uh, Juno, just going back to, to what you were saying about the uh, the safety of the, the vaccine there that you mentioned, um, what reassurance can we can we give to, to the person that's asked this question? Yeah, so I work with people from different nationalities. One of them, the black community, the, the majority of them do not want to have the COVID jab, Juno. OK, so uh, it's a really important question. And I think that uh, you're right. A lot of people from the Bain community, black, Asian, minority, ethnic, don't want to have the vaccine. Uh, luckily, it, I would say it's not the majority, but it's, it's a large percentage. So uh, what we've done is uh, we've tried to produce as much information as possible to reassure people uh, and uh, prominent or not prominent, but uh, lots of uh, healthcare professionals who are in the public eye, who are from the Bain community, have had their vaccines and, and uh, publicly acknowledge, acknowledge they've had it, really just to try and encourage people to say, uh, we think it's safe, we trust the vaccine enough to have it ourselves. And I have uh, uh, black uh, friends and colleagues who are doctors who've had it. Uh, I've had it myself. Uh, so uh, the other thing we've done, uh, and I, I want to give this a plug, and, and, and please spread this information more widely amongst the people you know, is that we've created a really good website called SNE, S N W -E, vaccine. Uh, .org .uk. But if you just type in uh, Suffolk and North East Essex, so S-N-E-E, uh, vaccine into Google, it'll bring it up straight away. And along the top line, it's got a frequently asked questions section, uh, and it covers a lot of the misinformation uh, that has been spread, as well as the very legitimate questions that a lot of people ask. Has it been rushed through? Is it safe? Was it tested on? people of different nationalities and ethnicities, the answer is yes to all of those. And does it contain a chip? Does it contain uh, any uh, animal products, etc.? So all sorts of questions. And, I, and what I would say is that there are no bad questions, okay? Every question is legitimate because you've got to be happy to have it. The other thing I think I should say, Simon, very quickly is that some studies showed that before the vaccine was released, 40% of doctors actually said they didn't want to be first in line to have the vaccine. Uh, but now that, what, is it 17, 18 million people have been vaccinated in this country alone? I personally don't know of any doctors uh, who have declined the vaccine. Uh, in fact, they're usually very keen to get it. So please remember that some of the information that was out there about healthcare professionals being reluctant to have the vaccine, uh, though there will of course be some people who are still reluctant to have the vaccine, but that information really goes back to December. And I don't know of a single doctor who's actually declined to have the vaccine yet. Or, uh, yeah, and, and so I would say it's safe. We know it's safe. Okay, 40,000 people were tested in the trials. 
but that's not going to pick up the one in a hundred thousand side effects or the one in a million side effects. But now that millions of people have been vaccinated, all the rarer side effects are also out in the open. And as I say, no one's died, no one's had any serious illness from the vaccine. Thanks very much, Juno. Anybody else want to come in with a response in relation to that question at all? OK, I suppose uh, a follow up question to that, which which does link to the previous question. There are rumours escalating in the BAME communities that the vac vaccine is harmful in line with the previous question that we've just had. How can we end such rumours, especially to those who don't speak English as their first language? And Juno, you've done a, a fair bit of work in relation to that as well, working with me uh, on, on that. Do you want to just highlight some of the examples of work that's that's been done? Uh, yeah, so we've uh, we've done a, a few online events. Uh, we've also reached out uh, with with Stuart and, and uh, Stuart Keeble and some others uh, to carers uh, because uh, they were in the top two cohorts that needed vaccination, but some of them were uh, were sceptical. Uh, we that was a recorded thing; it, it went onto YouTube uh, because quite a lot of the carers, of course, are from uh, ethnic backgrounds. But even the uh, people from non-ethnic backgrounds uh, also had uh, questions. Uh, we tried to support the, the local uh, charities, and get the information out uh, on, on our website. There is information in different languages as well on some of the frequently asked questions. So uh, that's just a small section of some of the stuff we're doing. But, but ultimately, uh, I think that you can only do a certain amount to convince people to have the vaccine because it's a personal choice if they decide not to. I think it's their right not to. But I would say, why would you not want to? If you look at the information on our website, it's accurate. Uh, BAME uh, healthcare workers and uh, uh, whether they're doctors, nurses or people who just work in hospitals and computer surgeries have had the vaccine. Uh, so it, it is safe, uh, but ultimately people are only going to believe what they're going to believe. But I'm sure there might be one or two other panel members who have a uh, have some input on that question. Okay, thank you, Juno. Ed. Yeah, so we, we've um, I mean part of the part of the way forward is having good conversations and listening, um, and we've been working with a number of faith groups in Suffolk and North East Essex and. Um, listening to the adaptations we can make to the sites uh, to make it work for different people in different communities. So uh, at Colchester um, Stadium site, uh, tomorrow we're working with the Colchester Mosque and uh, the Bangladeshi Women's Association and the Refugee Association to, to, to make the relevant changes at that site uh, to bring people forward. We're doing similar at Clacton on Sunday and uh, similar at the Ipswich site at Gainsborough um, uh, for, for the, the day after. So um, some of this is about making adaptation. I think one of the themes that has come through is that um, in certain communities people are more comfortable to come to a vaccination centre as a family rather than as an individual. And that's something we, we're looking to get flexibility around because the, the national cohorts that have been set out are set out by age group, which rather restricts families coming with different generations. So we're very keen to look at different ways of providing the vaccination service to our communities in a way that make people feel more comfortable and make, make it feel more approachable. So as, as Juno said, this is about listening and and, and working through the barriers and, and and making sure, as Mark said, that everyone's protected. So we're, we're putting a lot of effort into this area. Thanks, Ed. Mark? Thank you. And um, in, in medicine, we look at, you know, what's a quality outcome? And it has three main main features. It's, is the treatment, um, a quality outcome of a treatment, is, is it safe? Um, does it do the job? And does the experience the receiving patient have, is that good enough? Um, and we know with this vaccine that it's safe and that it does the job. And it's important that we give time so that people can have um, the time to absorb the information that they have um, to develop the trust in that um, treatment, 
to be able to then come forward and have it. And as Ed and Juno have said, it's around listening, around being able to inform in a way that people can understand and being culturally competent to be able to deliver it in the way that is needed so that everyone has the opportunity to have this, not just uh, those who are are able to, to absorb all of this as a matter of thought. Uh, Simon, I forgot to say as well that uh, there is a, a bus uh, which is about to uh, go into service where we're going to uh, outreach to particular areas and groups where we know that uh, people maybe feel more comfortable if we come to them. Uh, so that's another local initiative. And and really, it, it's terribly important to realise that uh, certain ethnic groups, their risk of uh, having serious illness or dying from the uh, from COVID are actually significantly higher. Uh, black men, for example, are three times the risk of their white counterparts. So your risk is greater, which means it's even more important you have the vaccine. This vaccine is for everyone. Uh, and I think the government showed that last week when they did the uh, the um, thing that went out last Thursday, I think it was before the nine o'clock, 10 o'clock news across all the commercial channels uh, with BME people, stars really, uh, recommending people have it. So I, I think that any scepticism from past inequalities or past things that happen really don't apply here in the UK in the 21st century. So please have the vaccine. OK, thank you very much indeed, Juno. I'm going to move us on to the, the next question that we've received, and it's from Ellie. She writes, I am an anxious asthmatic who no longer meets the criteria for group six, which was changed last week. I am 36 years old. When can I expect to get a vaccine now? I've had oral steroids in the past, but not in the last year, as I've been shielding and taking great care. Is that a question perhaps for our, uh, our GPs this evening, Mark? Thank you, Ellie, for that question. And and yes, as as we've said before, the um, the the committee for uh, vaccination have given this uh, uh, decision around um, this additional group and splitting the asthma, which is has been causing anxiety. Uh, and I can fully understand that. But the the, the reason is that um, uh, some asthmatic groups, as we know, there's a there's a great spread of um, uh, the way that asthma affects people and so it's important that those who have the most highest risk get that uh, vaccination first and uh, even though you may have a diagnosis of asthma it may put you at the lower risk um, and to come in into your age group profile so um, I can understand the anxiousness that that may, uh, that may uh, create but there have been um, scientific reasons behind the uh, decision. And in terms of when um, within your age group, it will be, um, uh, as we were saying, sort of certainly before uh, the end of July. Um, but in terms of that age group, um, not quite sure really. Do we know when we might expect that? I don't know that we do. Did, did, did did you say that her age was 56? 36. 36. 36. Um, yeah, I don't know. Certainly before the end of July. So before the end of July, Ellie, I hope that helps you. Um, any other comments or, or um, yeah, comments in relation to that particular point from Ellie? Uh, the only thing I was going to say was that one of the really big charities, uh, I can't remember if it was Asthma UK or the British Respiratory Society, uh, did say that approximately four or five percent of people would be classified as having severe asthma. So they produced this guidance, I think, last spring uh, when the shielding lists were being uh, pulled together by practices. So uh, the majority, the vast majority of asthmatics don't fall into the severe uh, asthma group, uh, maybe, as I say, one in 20 would. So I think some asthmatics are clearly at high risk, but the majority aren't. Uh, yeah, that's really all I want to say. 
Okay, thank you, Juno. Um, next question is, we have friends in other parts of the country that are now vaccinating 60 and over. Is Suffolk behind the curve? And when can we expect 60 and over in North Suffolk? Ed, is that a question you might be able to come in on at all? Yeah, of, of course. So we're, we're not behind the curve. We're near the top of the table nationally. So we're, we're doing well comparatively to other systems. Um, we, uh, we're working on cohort five at the moment, which is age 65 to 69, and then cohort six, which is people with underlying health conditions between 16 and 64. So we are um, giving first dose to some people that are of the age uh, described, but only if they meet the criteria for, for um, cohort six, if that's helpful, Simon. Thank you, Ed. Can I can I just add, Simon? The other the other cohort that these people may have been within is um, health and social care workers. So a, a huge huge number of our population work in health and social care, and obviously we've been they were one of our our first priority groups. So it may be people hear of people in other age groups getting vaccinated, but usually there's a a reason behind it that they they were actually working in healthcare or, or something. OK, thank you, Lisa. Uh, next question. Uh, can young people with medical conditions receive the vaccine, for example, 16 to 18 year olds? Is uh, Pam, Pam, you able to come in on that one at all? I think that might be best pointed to one of our GPs, but at the moment <laughs> the licence doesn't cover um, for the vaccines uh, below 16. So between 16 and 18, um, I, I think it's uh, very much down to the clinical risk, um, but also it would depend on which vaccine uh, was being offered at the place that you were being uh, looked after. So I don't know whether uh, Mark or David would like to add anything to that. Mark, would you like to pick that up? Mark? Yeah, um, one of the vaccines is um, uh, uh, okay for 16 to 18. I think it's AZ is okay over 18. Yeah. Might be the Pfizer um, is um, uh, fine for 16 to 18. Okay, thank you very much. David, do you have any comments in relation to that? No, no, just that, that was, that's correct. Pfizer is 16 plus, AZ is 18 plus. Okay. Simon, I could just expand it a little bit beyond that. And that is that uh, children who are under 16 uh, who have uh, severe illnesses that put them at high risk in conjunction with their specialist rather than the GP, uh, some of these children can be vaccinated, say with complex neurological problems. Uh, this would be an off license uh, uh, application of the vaccine uh, and the parents and the specialists have a chat as to whether they feel it's appropriate. So uh, people who are really at high risk can have the vaccine, whatever their age, but as long but that's an individual decision rather than a national decision. OK, thank you very much indeed, Juno. Thanks to everyone who's posted their questions this evening. We're not going to get through every single one of them, but we're, we will um, use the next five minutes or so just to get through as many as we can. The next question is, why are there so many side effects of the vaccine? I know people who have had uh, the vaccine and they've been terribly ill. Uh, Juno, is that something you might be able to answer? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do. So you almost have to ask yourself, is the benefit of having either the drug or the vaccine or the medication much greater than the risk of the illness? So we know that uh, maybe what 5% of people uh, could be severely affected. I can't remember the exact numbers now. Uh, if you have COVID, probably 10 to 20 percent will actually end up with so-called long COVID where you feel absolutely awful for lots of different reasons for over uh, 12 weeks. So uh, the vaccine can kill you, can just make you very ill or can give you long COVID. And even if you've just got a moderately bad dose, you'd be unwell for a, a two or three weeks at least. The vaccine itself uh, tends to cause side effects for one or two days on average. So the answer is, yeah, it's a shame that it has some side effects, but uh, they are really small compared to actually getting the illness. So, uh, and, and generally speaking, 
the, the worst side effect for the majority of people is a bit of an achy arm for a, uh, for a day or two. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, here's a question. Which groups are currently being vaccinated in North East Essex? Pam, is that one you can uh, address, please? Yeah, so uh, we're working through our uh, 64s and overs at the moment. Uh, we, as you know, have got quite a... Um, an age, uh, a high age in our um, population. So we've got some of our biggest cohorts between the age of 64 uh, and above. Um, but as soon as we get through those age groups, obviously uh, we'll be working through uh, the other cohorts. But we're we're also making sure that we do uh, the carers and uh, the uh, clinically vulnerable that we're able to. So the ages merge a little bit depending on the clinical presentation, but that's where we are at the moment. Thank you, Pam. Um, a couple of people have asked this question. Which vaccine will we get in Suffolk, Pfizer or Oxford? Ed, is that uh, a question you might be able to answer, please? It depends on which site you go to, I, um, I suppose. That, but both both vaccines are uh, present in our system and being used, so it really depends on the on, on the site that you're sent to. Okay, and uh, and maybe just to expand on that a little bit, which which sites would offer which vaccine? David to come in. David. So, so um, each of the sites has different uh, deliveries over over the course of different periods. So, um, so the one thing you can't predict um, in ahead is what uh, vaccine is going to be uh, available on a certain day, and all of the sites have in common that there's they there's no choice for patients um, in terms of which vaccine unless there's a very small minority who, who need uh, a specific vaccine, but a very small one, which is where a, a doctor's recommended it. But otherwise, it, um, it's it's what's a, what a vaccine is available on the day at that site. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we'll make, sorry, Mark, you want to come in there, Mark? Yeah, and just to, to um, say also that um, whilst there may be a bit of unpredictability about which vaccine comes to which site at what time, the intention is still that the second dose that you receive will be the um, the same vaccine that you had uh, for your first dose. So um, that 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 still remains the absolute intention. Uh, there there are say there are potential safety issues about um, operating two uh, vaccine types in the same centre at the same time because they have different uh, considerations in terms of the drawing up and the mixing and the. Uh, the use of it. So um, it, it tends to be one vaccine per site at any one particular time. OK, thank you very much indeed, Mark. And we'll make uh, this next question the last one for this evening. Is the panel happy with the regularity and certainty of vaccine supply into the SNE ICS? Um, who could answer that? Ed, is that something you could uh, pick up or David? Um, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question, isn't it? Um, I think we'll be happy once we can draw down exactly what we want when we want it. At the moment, we're still dependent on uh, effectively what's pushed out to us, which can be kind of short notice uh, and uh, can be slightly unpredictable. So we we understand that there will be much greater vaccination supply uh, from mid March, um, and that will be really really helpful to us. Uh, because we, we want to get through uh, this program as quickly as possible uh, because we think that's a great thing for our population. So uh, we're not entirely happy, but we, we, we are. We will be happy very soon, I'm sure. The, the, the regularity is certainly much, much better now than it was when we first first started. Um, and, and like Ed said, you know, we would we would love to have more, but that wouldn't then be fair on, on other areas. Um, in the country, so you know we're we're doing really well as a as a system in Suffolk and North East Essex. So uh, we you know we want to just stay carry on doing what we're doing and staying at the top. Thanks, David. And uh, Mark had his hand up. Mark. Yeah, I, I I think we should be happy overall because we have managed to vaccinate over three hundred and forty thousand people so far in a time frame that was never expected. Um, and uh, so I, I think this has been a really good story. We had a great plan. It may have started at a time that people were impatient about, but that's just how it was. But the, uh, the, 
the vaccine coming through, the capacity that we've been able to manage to deliver, I think we should all be very pleased about. Thanks very much indeed, Mark. I'm going to pass over to Ed in just uh, a second, just to wind the session up for today. I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed for your questions. And please uh, do check out the website regularly. It's www.snevaccine, S-N-E-E, vaccine.org.uk for the latest information and Q&As. Over to Ed. Thank you. Um, th thanks, Simon. So just a big thank you for everyone who's attended tonight and uh, ask your questions. I hope you got decent answers. I think everyone's um, answered them uh, as honestly as possible. Um, and thank you for all your support. This is very much a, a team effort, not only uh, with the clinical staff in our system, but uh, with the volunteers and the public uh, too. So we absolutely appreciate everyone's um, efforts. So uh, I think uh, that's us done for tonight. We're very happy to um, hold further community sessions in the coming weeks and months so that you have this chance to speak to us um, and uh, we, we, we really value them because we learn a lot from the questions and the issues that are raised. So thank you very much from all of us and thank you to the panel for joining us. Ed, uh, can I just uh, answer, someone's put a question specifically about someone who's had allergic reactions, this is uh, Rob, about his wife. Uh, the answer is that if she's had anaphylaxis and EpiPen, we've now set up a system whereby they can be referred to the hospital uh, to have uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine in a safe environment. So make sure that that happens, please. Thank you, Juno. Good night, everyone. Good night.